2007 to order. Will you please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Barnwell? Here. Balcone? Horton? Here. House? Here. Schneider? Williams? Here. Mayor Bloom? Here, Schneider just walked in. Um, public comment, do we have anything? We have no members of the public here. It's amazing. Must be a budget meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a cat leash law hearing? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, you want to start this? Or, or oh, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, we are here today to continue the discussion of the fiscal year 2008 recommended budget. Uh, this is the second of five public hearings, special budget meetings we're going to have. And today we are going to be covering three departments. Uh, the first we'll start with is the waterfront department, and then that will be followed by the airport department. And then lastly, but not least, we'll be covering the fire, finance, fire department. Uh, we are scaled to go from one to three, so two hours, and so we hopefully, or we intend to fit all those three in within that time frame. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Scott Reedman, the waterfront business manager. Okay, Mr. Reedman. <coughs> Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Scott Reedman, Business Manager for the Waterfront Department. Um, just by way of background in the Waterfront Department organization, we have three divisions and nine programs. The Business Division oversees the Administration and uh, Community Relations, Property Management Program, the Financial Management Program, and our Parking Services Program. The Operations Division oversees Harbor Patrol and Marina Management, and the Facilities Division oversees uh, facilities maintenance in the harbor, facilities maintenance on the wharf, and also our Facilities Design and Capital Program. Just to give you a brief outline of what today's presentation will contain, we'll have an overview of each of the programs. Uh, we'll look at the expenditures by program as well as the revenue by program. And then we'll move into some of the the fun stuff, the budget highlights for fiscal year 2008, you know, key projects and initiatives, uh, program and staffing levels, proposed fee changes, and we'll spend a little bit of time on the capital program because it's fairly intensive in fiscal year 2008. And we'll wind up with our performance measurement, uh, performance measures, including those that tie in with the Sustainable Santa Barbara program. Again, more as background for the public that might be watching at home, the Waterfront Department is an enterprise fund and has some similarities to private sector businesses in that the uh, Waterfront Department does not receive any revenue, any tax revenue or revenue from the general fund. And the services that we provide must be paid for by user fees, which in our case is typically lease rents and parking fees, slip fees, and so forth. The Waterfront Department is tasked with managing all navigable, navigable waters and tidelands bordered by the city limits, subject to the terms and conditions of the state tidelands grant, and the tidelands are to be run for the benefit of all the citizens of the state of California. Sometimes people get a little confused and they think the harbor is just for Santa Barbarans, but we operate it for the benefit of the state. Of course, uh, the course of that operations involves maintaining and operating Stearns Wharf, the harbor proper, and the waterfront parking lots. And this involves managing approximately 60 real estate leases, 1,133 marina slips, and eight pu public parking lots from the Cabrillo parking lots in the east to Ledbetter parking lot in the west. Uh, moving on to the projected expenditures, our administration and community relations program we're proposing a $3.5 million uh, budget for fiscal year 2008. The administration program is, is a fairly large program in that we have some very big ticket items in that program, including our debt service, insurance, and overhead allocation. So we have some, some big uh, expenses that make that program look as large as it is. Property management, we're projecting a $242,000, $243,000 budget for 2008. Financial management, 179000 Parking services, $972,000 program, the bulk of which is uh, salaries, hourly salaries. Harbor Patrol, we're proposing uh, $1.6 million, $1 million 
expense budget for fiscal year 2008, and that again is mostly salaries for our 10 officers and our supervisor. And the Marina Management Program, that's a support program for Harbor Patrol and also our public counter, that program is budgeted at 306000 Facilities maintenance is the other major program at $3.5, $3.6 million projected for fiscal year 2008. And again, that's for maintaining the harbor as well as Stearns Wharf. Uh, the bulk of this is supplies and services. We have some big contracts and a lot of maintenance going on. Our facilities are subject to uh, severe environmental conditions, the marine environment, wave action, and so forth. So that keeps the facilities folks busy. And those are our biggest programs. And finally, the facilities design and, and capital improvement program. This is just waterfront department oversight of these projects as virtually all of our capital improvement projects are contracted out. And this is just for department staff oversight of these projects. So overall, we're looking at an increase of about $665,000 from fiscal year 2007 to fiscal year 2008, which is about a 6.6% increase uh, going to $10.7 million. If you include fiscal year 2009, it, it uh, comes out to about a 10% increase overall, about a million dollar increase from fiscal year 2007, 2008, and 2009, which equates to about five percent per year, which is not out of line with the uh, cost of living and inf inflationary trends that we're seeing. Uh, included in the 10.7 million that I just uh, described, including in the department's 10.7 million budget for fiscal year 2008, are costs that the department pays to the general fund for services provided to the waterfront enterprise. And these include parking lot maintenance, the Parks and Recreation Division, as we're all familiar, uh, maintains the landscaping in our waterfront parking lots. Uh, so we have budgeted $217,000 for that program. Information Systems Funding, this is $86,000 budgeted for uh, computer support and server support. Waterfront, Waterfront as an enterprise fund purchases all of its computer workstations, servers, printers, um, software, licensing and all of the expendables directly. This is for support for the workstations, the help desk and server support, etc. A new program beginning this year is the Geographical Information System. I won't get into that. It's a citywide program. I'm sure you'll be hearing that a lot of that from each department. We'll be kicking that off in fiscal year 2008 with a new allocation. Building maintenance and facilities maintenance, we've budgeted $40,000 for. Vehicle replacement in motor pool, we've budgeted 39000 almost 40000 And again, motor pool vehicle maintenance is $41,000. And this is to maintain the 13 vehicles that the waterfront department uses. Some other uh, cost allocations that we contribute to the general fund for services provided to our department are telephone support, uh, $18,900. Uh, the communications program is actually radio support for our radios that Harbor Patrol, maintenance, and parking rely upon, and that's a $36,000 uh, reimbursement to the general fund. And this year, for the first time, liability insurance and property insurance have been have been broken out. So liability insurance is $72,000, property insurance is $245,000 for the waterfront department. And the property insurance is, is simply a function of the, the value of the, the buildings and the structures, the marinas, uh, pier, and so forth. And finally, overhead allocation, $665,000 allocation. That's for 22 different programs that the general fund provides services to the waterfront, including payroll services, human resources, finance department support, city attorney support, city administrator, and so forth. So that sums up the allocated cost, ICS charges, and over, overhead allocation to the Waterfront Department. As I mentioned, over the next two years from fiscal year 07, 08, and 09, we're looking at about a 10% increase overall in our budget, which equates to just about a million dollars. We're going from about a $10 million budget to about an $11 million budget by 2009. Um, what does that mean? All those percentages and numbers I just rattled off are a little bit difficult to track. We looked into what the big numbers were that are that are uh, making up this increase, 
and salaries and benefits is the biggest one obviously these are simply negotiated with the bargaining units and so that's about half of the million that uh, we're seeing over the next two years right behind that are supplies and services primarily in our uh, wharf and harbor facilities maintenance programs what we found over the last couple of years we had a series of I guess crisis is too se severe of a word but you'll recall that we had some serious insurance increases we were dealing one year with significant increases in the PERS allocations and so when we were faced with those impacts where we really tightened the belt was in our facilities uh, maintenance department we deferred maintenance that we needed to do and we, we that's where we held the line on our budget so we were really characterizing this year as as an adjustment year where we're bringing back uh, projects that have been deferred and and money that we needed to allocate to our uh, facilities maintenance folks who have been very good in holding the line these last two or three years um, following that we're looking at about hundred twenty nine thousand dollar increase in ICS charges and allocated costs also marina one debt service um, assuming we get our loan from the Department of Boating and Waterways um, we've factored in hundred and two thousand dollars for the first uh, set of debt service for that loan we applied for that loan on March 30th um, we've got some positive feedback from the Department of Boating and Waterways but it's going to be a long process and if the council has any questions on that I can I can definitely clear up where we're at it with the Marina one loan from the Department of Boating and Waterways and finally uh, about twelve thousand dollars in additional equipment that we put off buying so that that equates to uh, the bulk of the million dollar increase in our budget over the next two years Uh, moving on to revenues our parking revenue for fiscal year 2008 is proposed to be 1.8 million dollars marina management 4.9 we're expecting lease revenue of about just about four million dollars and interest on our reserves of two hundred ninety one thousand dollars you'll see we do not have a figure there for grants because we don't have or Bob, oh, I'm trying to follow along on the revenue projections. Can you give me not the page it reference? I'm sorry, it's slide number ten on well, page on page, page four. I don't see it in the book. Page what? Page four, top the fourth slide. page. Four. We have three hundred and oh, in your budget book. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. G three twenty six. Three twenty six. Oh, that's what I was looking at. How come I'm missing it? I think he's broken them out even more here. Or C9. This is straight off of G326. But. Just to escape, there you go. But what you've done is broken it down further. I'm trying to see. Right. Correct, Madam Mayor, parking Council Member Horton. I, I broke I, I broke down the fees and charges into parking and marina management. There you go. I'm hoping that was trying to clarify rather than confuse by doing that. No, no, that's, you did clarify up there, but not here. So that's fine. Okay. Does everybody have it now? You see what he did? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks for asking. I'm sorry. We interrupted you, but. Apologize for that uh, it's okay. confusion. Go there. Ahead. Well, if you, but if you look at the, the okay. C nine chart, the chart on C nine. C nine. But some some of the proposed 08 numbers down the line are different than what's listed in the proposed 08 numbers. For example, other revenue on the board up here is 245, 540, and this one's 239, 185. Yeah. I think Scott's broken them out a little differently because you notice that the total is the same. Yeah, the total we got. We'll trust you. <laughs> I believe the difference is there's about a six thousand and change um, issue with the ice house on the city pier, and there's a discrepancy whether it goes into other revenues or property management. I believe in this one, I've, uh, or marina management. And I believe in this one, it's in marina management. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that that's how the totals equal. It's this little ice house issue that. <laughs> Okay. It's very difficult to track down. Okay. <laughs> so moving on uh, to the grants, uh, we don't have any 
grants for sure coming in right at this time, so we didn't budget anything, but we are pursuing grants, and I have a slide later on, and I'll explain where we are with uh, pursuing grant opportunities, but we didn't have anything definite enough to budget for. And then other revenue, $245,000. That's miscellaneous revenue that comes from, for instance, our catamaran beach permits, our outrigger beach permits, sale of surplus property, reimbursement from damage to city property, and other miscellaneous sources such as that. So the bottom line, which hopefully manages your <laughs> matches your budget, is uh, 11355000 about a 3.9% increase in revenue, or $424,000 increase in revenue is what we're budgeting. Perhaps this slide explains it a little more graphically. Uh, again, marina management is budgeted at $4.9 million, property management at four. Coming in next at 1.8 million is parking services, and there's our interest on our reserve funds at 291,000, and that pesky miscellaneous revenue of 245. <laughs> Some key projects and initiatives. Beach permits and stuff. That, that, some key projects and initiatives that we will be working on that over the next two fiscal years, of course, will be the Sustainable Santa Barbara program. Also, our ongoing uh, Clean Marina program. As you know, we're very proud of being a certified uh, California Clean Marina. We fly our Clean Marina flag every day. Um, the West Beach Pedestrian Improvement Projects, that's not really a waterfront department project. It's an RDA project, as you're well aware. We're more the client in this case, and we're interfacing between the Harbor Merchants Association and the Harbor users, and of course working with RDA staff and Conceptual Motion to facilitate this uh, very important project as it moves forward. Another initiative that we've been faced with is Daria. Uh, it's an invasive algae, uh, invasive Japanese kelp, if you will, that has become a problem in many harbors up and down the coast. We've come to the conclusion we're not going to be able to eliminate this invasive algae. Um, the best we're going to be able to do is manage it. We've had several dives and it seems to be spreading. Um, so we're going to be working on, I'll, I'll describe that further on the grant slide. We'll be pursuing grant monies uh, to abate this problem. Again, Marina One construction financing and the construction itself will be probably the biggest items that we'll be facing in the next two budget years, both getting the loan from the Department of Boating and Waterways and then initiating the, the phased construction of, of Marina One. And then, well, sort of a dream that we're pursuing is a multi-agency fire boat, and that would be something uh, shared by the county sheriffs, the county fire department, the Carpinteria Fire Department, um, an additional fire boat. We have two boats with firefighting capability, but we've got uh, Casitas Pier, Haskell's Pier, well outside of our jurisdiction, and no real way to uh, assist from the ocean should these wooden piers catch fire at some point. Okay, here we go with the grant opportunities. Um, as you may recall, last year we received a grant to repower our patrol boat too. Uh, the State Department of Boating and Waterways gave us funding to put some new diesel engines in that fire boat. We have an ongoing relationship with the Department of Boating and Waterways on abandoned watercraft abatement, which is when we identify a boat out in the, the Fool's Anchorage or one runs aground, we can apply for reimbursement from the Department of Boating and Waterways. Fortunately, we had a fairly mild year and we didn't have too much of that occurring. Again, the in, in Undaria Management Program, we're working with the Ocean Protection Council on getting a $75,000 grant over the span of the next two years to have uh, NOAA and other agencies assist us with diving the harbor and removing it from the pilings and the seafloor in the harbor itself, within the harbor. And then again, the dream of the multi-agency fire boat, this would be through a Department of Homeland Security grant via the State Office of Emergency Services and also the County Office of Emergency Services uh, we estimate it would be in the amount of about $200,000. We've thrown our hat into the ring on this. There are a lot of people vying for this Homeland Security money, including Chief Sanchez and Chief Prince. So we'll see uh, who gets what when this is all done. In terms of staffing levels, the Waterfront Department consists of 46 full-time employees, full-time equivalents. 
Uh, administration of, and community relations is 4.6 employees. Business and parking programs, 6.4 employees. We have 15 full-time employees in the Harbor Patrol and Marina Management and 20 in the facilities, maintenance, and capital design programs. As part of this budget, we are not proposing any new positions or reclassifications of existing positions. We'll remain at 46 full-time equivalents. And I'd like to point out that salaries and benefits consist of about 48.7% of the Waterfront Department's operating budget. Proposed fee changes, these are included in your packet, I imagine, as in, in the fee resolution that we submitted to finance. Uh, we're proposing to add an honor fee collection system in the Palm Park parking lot, similar to the one we added in the Garden Street parking lot last year. What we found was we put the honor fee system in place during the week in the Garden Street parking lot and everybody moved across the street to the Palm Park parking lot where it's free. So we are going to uh, add an honor fee system over there to balance things out. We're proposing a 2% slip fee increase in fiscal year 08 and 09, hoping that an incremental fee increase, slip fee increase each year um, is easier to pull through than uh, it, it just establishes a mindset that slip fees are a regular thing every July 1st and not once every blue moon in, in reaction to some sort of crisis situation. So. We're also proposing a $25 per foot slip transfer fee increase in fiscal year 2008 in, in all sizes of slips and a $25 per foot slip transfer fee increase in fiscal year 09 on all slip lengths except for 20 foot slips. We believe we have hit the, the high side of, uh, of slip transfer fees for the small 20 foot slips and in fact the trend in the industry is getting away from 20-foot slips entirely. Many of the harbors we look at are eliminating them or don't have them. 20-foot boats are generally fairly easily trailerable. Uh, each January we do a slip fee survey of 18 different uh, marinas in about eight different harbors up and down the coast from Oceanside to Santa Cruz. Um, I, I simplified it, this chart, so it would be readable, but we, we survey everything from key card costs, parking fees, um, visitor slip fees, and uh, of course the most important regular slip fees. And if you look at the marinas surveyed, again, on the left-hand column, you can see that many of the marinas don't have the 20-foot slips, as I just mentioned. But near the bottom, the green line there, greenish-blue line, is what the average of the surveyed ports and harbors had. So, for instance, looking at 30-foot slips, which most of the surveyed harbors do have, we find that the average is $304 a month slip fee. And Santa Barbara Harbor is $225 a month, and that's including the proposed 2% increase on July 1st. Similarly, with the 40-foot slips, we see uh, the average being $442 a month. Santa Barbara's at $326 a month with the July 1st 2% increase and so on. So we believe there is room there for uh, gradual incremental increase in the slip, in the, uh, slip fees. Being an enterprise fund, we're responsible for the waterfront capital improvement projects. Uh, we're faced with aging facilities, facilities that were built in the early 20th century to mid 20th century in a lot of cases. Um, these facilities have, give us an increasing demand for repair and replacement. And each time we do this, we have to look to our fees and our revenues and adjust them to fund the increased capital needs. And examples of this are the Marina 1 rehabilitation that I mentioned, the Marina 4B reconfiguration, so we can accommodate one larger vessel instead of uh, accommodate three larger vessels instead of one. Our annual Stearns Wharf pile driving contract and next year we'll be embarking upon um, some, some significant structural repairs to the Navy Pier, also known as the City Pier. So here's a rundown of the capital improvement program for the next two years. Uh, again, the, the new uh, GIS implementation for fiscal year 2008. Uh, citywide FMS replacement, it doesn't actually appear as a capital project, but it is it's a project that uh, it does factor into our budget. 
uh, the emergency passenger loading ramp and generator. This is in case we have uh, a catastrophe on Stearns Wharf, perhaps a fire where the power is out. So we can use this generator to operate the passenger loading ramp and evacuate the wharf more effectively by sea. The Marina 4B reconfiguration I mentioned to accommodate three vessels instead of one. Annual uh, marina repair. And then, of course, the biggest project we're faced with is the Marina 1 walkway replacement and the associated utilities with that. We we'll also have the Navy Pier timber replacement and our annual parking lot slurry sealing and striping maintenance program. We go do a different lot each year on about a five to eight year cycle. And we have some relatively minor capital improvement projects, including replacing some compressors on the wharf, replacing the roof on the 117 Harbor Way building. You're all familiar with that. That's the Minnow Cafe, Blue Water Hunter, and the brand new Fish Market building. Uh, also replacing the roof on the Marine Center building at 125 Harbor Way. That's where the Harbor Market is, and all of our yacht brokers are in that building. Um, some sewer line work on the wharf and ongoing sidewalk repairs uh, along the Marina 2, 3, and 4 walkway. The Stearns Wharf annual pile driving contract at about $350,000 a year. And we've thrown in some money to upgrade and, upgrade and stabilize the accommodation dock. That $10,000 is to look at some engineering and design. It's where all of our visiting boat, boats first come in, and if you get more than three or four people getting off the boat, it starts rocking back and forth, and it's fairly unstable. So we're going to try Scott, to I can't that. get that to match with page 163 of the capital project. Maybe I'm just looking at the wrong numbers. It's, it's definitely because the FMS replacement will not show up on there. I'm pretty sure that will be the reason. For fiscal year 2008, the $10,000, and then the 61000 in fiscal year 2009. Well, I'm sorry I don't have that that part of the document with me, but I can certainly reconcile that and, and get that information to you if that's acceptable. Sure. Sure. Is that Roger? Oh, fine, fine. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Just in terms of capital projects that we've recently completed or are working on right at the moment, uh, we just recently completed some interior dredging along Marina 2, 3, and 4 seawall and the fish float north replacement. Currently in progress, we have the second phase of the breakwater cap repair. Uh, we expect completion of that project in June of 2007, next month. And of course, upcoming Marina 1 replacement, beginning with significant landside utility upgrades, the main walkway replacement, and after we get the main walkway replacement, we'll do phased replacement of the finger docks working from east to west. Again, that'll be approximately a 10-year project, and it'll dominate our capital improvement plan for the next 10 years or so. If you go down to the harbor today, this is what you'll see. This is, I believe it's Cushman Contracting working on the breakwater cap repair. The demolition is complete, and they're, in the, they're uh, forming and pouring the concrete on the sidewalk right now. You can see the epoxy coated rebar, so hopefully it won't corrode as quickly as the last batch did and we'll have a, a better product. Uh, once they're done with the sidewalk, they'll begin the parapet wall, which you can see the rebar going up for the parapet wall. They'll begin framing and pouring that in the next several weeks. And that's going on today. I'd like to also explain that I'm going to show you four slides here, including this one, and all of these projects were initiated after January 1st of this year, so we've been very busy in terms of capital projects down at the Waterfront Department. This is Fish Float 2 that I mentioned. It's the floating commercial fishing dock in front of Brophy Brothers, as seen from the uh, Waterfront Center building in this case. The, you can see the new concrete dock being put into place and the pile driving crane on the uh, barge just there. This was completed, I believe, in March. Just very quick project. This was one aspect of our Marina 2, 3, and 4 dredging. Uh, this interesting device is, uh, they referred to it as a spider. It's a sort of a backhoe type of 
type of thing with a with a clamshell operating uh, apparatus on the end. They put it on a barge, and it, it was able to reach down and get quite a bit of cobble stones out of the launch ramp area and the fairway between Santa Barbara boat rentals and sea landing, which you can see here in the background. And we know we did some good because a fair amount of that cobble that came out of there had blue bottom paint on it from these vessels that you see here. So they were Ouch. they were hitting bottom on, on low tide. The tenants were very happy that we were able to get some of that cobble out of there. And this, this project was also completed a month or two ago. Uh, this is the Marina 4B lease area. Um, we had approximately 28 piles in this area where one vessel was moored. The piles had become uh, dilapidated, no longer functional. Uh, this photograph here shows our dive crew working with the City College uh, diving program. And we've upgraded our diving program to industry standards. We now have surface supplied air and communication. Our divers wear hard hats and work very closely with City College on these projects. It provides on-the-job training for the City College students and inexpensive help for our divers. So it's, it's really a nice collaboration. In fact, in, in this photograph, you you can't really tell, but that's uh, City College President John, John Romo overseeing yeah. operations there. Uh, he wanted to come down and see the, the dive team in action. So <laughs> um, the next phase will be after July 1st when this project funds. The demo is now done and we'll begin the construction of this project after July 1st. Okay, we like to show um, not just a two-year projection, but a six-year projection of our budget. And for the purposes of this projection, we um, are assuming a 2% revenue growth in property management and parking, a 2% slip fee increase each year, and again, a 25 per foot slip transfer fee each year, except for some of the smaller slips. And we factored in an hourly parking fee increase from $1.50 to $2 per hour in fiscal year 2010. Under that scenario, our revenue would grow from fiscal year 07 from 10.9 million to 12.7, almost 12.8 million in fiscal year 2013. Our expenses will be growing from 10 million in fiscal year 07 to 12.1 million in fiscal year 2013. And our, our net revenue after operating expenses will range from 371,000 to 835,000 during that time. So if this projection holds true, we'll be in the black, so to speak. We also like to show how the capital projects affect our reserve balances. Our policy reserves, like other city departments, we have a 25% policy reserve, which will be maintained through this six-year scenario. The Harbor Preservation Fund will also be maintained at its mandated levels between two and five million dollars. We're getting pretty close to the $2 million level in the out years of, of 2013. But again, this is with a very conservative forecast of 2% slip fee each year. And that will leave us with a total reserve balance of $6.2 million to $4.8 million during the six-year projection. Some of the key performance objectives and sustainability objectives we've put into this budget is to use at least 30% post-consumer recycled paper and all of our copiers and printers. We're actually experimenting with 100% at this point and it, we're not getting any jams, so we'll probably be going for 100% fairly soon on all of our machines. We'll be tracking the number of tenant contacts regarding sustainability issues such as energy and water conservation and so forth. We've been reducing office paper use by distributing the monthly AE and E reports and weekly budget progress reports electronically instead of the old way by paper. We're looking at acquiring and using an electric vehicle, a GEM vehicle for parking lot monitoring. Downtown parking was kind enough to loan us one last Wednesday, so we all took turns <laughs> tooling around town in that. And it makes 25 miles an hour seem very slow, but certainly adequate for our parking lot needs. Again, no, a Harbor Patrol objective is to reduce office paper by distributing watch logs electronically. Right now we currently get the watch logs by paper. Now continuing supporting the Clean Marina program by conducting the annual seafloor deb debris cleanup known as our clean sweep event where we put divers in the water and, and get years worth of flotsam and jetsam off the floor of the harbor. Uh, maintaining 50% of staff on flex work schedules and installing solar panels to generate, generate electricity on the Marina 2 restroom roof. 
In January, we went to the Harbor Commission with a mid-year review of our current year budget progress. And we were happy to announce to the Commission that we were on track to meet our current budget. We met with the Harbor Commission Budget Subcommittee in early February and subsequently presented this budget recommendation to the Commission on March 15th. The Harbor Commission uh, moved to support this recommended budget and recommended to City Council for approval and an incorporation into the City budget document. They also wanted to go on record as adding that the Commission supports the GIS Committee's plans to make the citywide GIS system available on the Internet for public use. We heard that loud and clear. They, they definitely wanted that to be, to be put forward so the public could use the, the GIS as appropriate. And that concludes the report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, sorry we interrupted you a couple times, but it was a good report. Um, Mr. Horton. Um, Scott, I have some P3 questions. Is this the time for that or not? Madam Mayor, Council Member Horton, that certainly would be fine. Why don't I just read them off? In, is that okay? Or? Okay. On, um, I'm looking at my budget book. Everybody has that? Yep. Okay, on um, G326, authorized position stays the same, but the hourly employee hours goes up by a couple thousand, three thousand. So I guess you're just going to work everybody harder. That's the question there. Um, on Why don't we stop and get that okay. answer? Okay. Just okay. because um, Mr. Williams and I, especially Mr. Williams, also had that question. Oh, okay. Why did the hourly numbers go up? Well, the... Yeah, Scott, uh, we're, you know, we're, I know, well, I, the reason why I piqued my interest and why I looked is because yeah, I know that I there's a lot of people mm -hmm. in your constituency that it have been maybe pushing for more hourly um, uh, labor, but, but it's the policy of the, of the city to reduce our hourly labor and, and waterfront um, hourlies are going up between four and five thousand hours per year depending on how you count and whether you're counting it from the difference between the actuals and the projected in uh, the um, uh, proposed or whether you're uh, doing the projected and the proposed it's between four and five thousand um, uh, of, of an increase uh, distributed between facilities maintenance parking and harbor patrol and um, I personally you know uh, don't like the look of that and, and would like to know why um, we need to do that and why we can't have any of those changed to full-time positions. Okay. Mr. Bradley. <coughs> Mr. Chair, uh, Councilman Williams, uh, primarily the permanency of um, the, in the parking program really doesn't work for us from the standpoint we don't put permanent workers in kiosk shift uh, work. That's where the majority of those hours are. Um, we do have facilities, uh, temporaries that work uh, C shift uh, on the wharf in the evening, off hours uh, during the weekends um, when we don't necessarily have um, a full contingent of facilities maintenance staff. Usually have one permanent um, both in the harbor and on the wharf, but the additional staffing uh, for those additional shift hours beyond the regular eight to five are filled with uh, temporaries. And the same is true for um, patrol. It's uh, through a what we call a crew member. They work during the um, normal eight to five hours with the harbor patrol officers working on the boats primarily or assisting with their foot patrols or boat patrols um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So we've looked at, I think what your question is, can we convert or should we convert those to permanent positions? And for the most part, like I say, in the parking program, it really doesn't work for us. And, and I could, I could um, understand that in parking, uh, but the majority of your growth is in facilities maintenance. It's 2,700 hour additional hours in facilities maintenance, and it's hard for me to understand why in facilities maintenance we couldn't change some of those temp hours to a uh, full-time position. And I, I'd really, uh, before I'm going to vote on this budget, since we don't have to today, I'd really like that to be scrutinized um, uh, and, and uh, fully explained why that would have to take place. Or please, the, the best thing for me is for you to look at 
you know, what that would take to change some of those to a full-time position. And, and again, Councilman Williams, if it's the council's directive not to use temporaries for those or hourlies for those positions, I guess in the facilities end of it, we could certainly make those permanent positions. I, I, I can't make that argument. We typically haven't done that because um, it, it just doesn't necessarily, we don't need them on a routine or regular basis. Um, permanent part-time may be something like that, but uh, they're not necessarily uh, an ongoing work product. They may be special projects on the wharf or in the harbor where we would add on the hourlies. Um, but I'm not, I, I guess it would be hard for a department head to argue against you want to make more permanence in our um, department. It is a cost factor. I hope you realize. I understand. That. Is there just any way that you could look at that before the final adoption? Okay. Mr. Horton, you had other questions? Yeah, a couple more. On page um, 335, the operating expense as a percent of revenue is a pretty key factor in my view, and it's, it goes, um, it seems like the wrong direction by 4%. If I'm reading this right, can you help me with that? Oh, I see down at the bottom performance measures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Madam Mayor, Council Member Horton, that's in our parking division, I believe, if I'm looking at the right page. Right. Parking services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excuse me, yes. And um, our performance measure there, I believe, is to keep it below 55%. So we're, we're meeting our measure. It is going, it is fluctuating, but it's remaining below our, our threshold. Just might want to keep, a, keep an eye on that. Then the, the last one I have is on page uh, 337, which is under the Harbor Patrol. And there's a really good uh, movement from uh, hours lost to injury from 728.5 to 410. Do you, do you know uh, what you can call the success there or why, why that would happen that way? Oh, yeah. Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Horton, we're very happy with that statistic, as is yes. the city administrator uh, and risk management. We had a lot of back injuries in Harbor Patrol f for several reasons. One of our patrolmen was pulling an anchor and had a back injury which required surgery. Um, I think we had four injuries in the last couple of years. Um, uh, I think all of them requiring surgery. So we've taken several measures, including back, um, back safety training. We um, got a, a different one of our Harbor Patrol officers was injured on Patrol Boat 4, which is our inflatable, and you sit on it somewhat like a motorcycle. You straddle the seat. We got a custom made seat uh, for that to, to lessen that. But I think perhaps the biggest thing that we did was we put a, a davit on patrol boat three, a, a small sort of crane-like thing. So if we have to pull another anchor, rather than using one of our officers back, we have now have a, a, de a device to do that. So um, we've taken several measures. And we're also ordering a new uh, tr vehicle for Harbor Patrol. And we're looking very closely at the ergonomically how that truck is going to be laid out so they're not hefting something heavy over the side of the of the bed rail. They're, they're picking up sea lions and all sorts of heavy things, and so we're trying to take that into account. Thank you. Good Do you have anything else? Okay. Mr. House? Let's see. On page... Um, let's look at page 343 for a second. I just want to be sure I understand uh, what I think is happening there as an effect of the capital um, program. The... Um, this is facilities design and capital programs, and then in the um, table down to where it says um, capital programs, page 343, G343. And at the lower part of the first big table there, uh, below total operating expenditures is the capital program pieces of uh, this part of your budget. And I've, um, and it appears that there's almost a direct correspondence between this capital program piece and the additional use of or rather the use of reserves below. So in one year it's 1.2 for facilities capital and then use of reserves 1.2 million. And then the next year 3.9 and 3.9. And the year after that 1.8 and 2.0. So you can kind of see that keep corresponding including the current year, upcoming year, and the future years. So is it my understanding then that the this capital program is almost, I, am I making a wrong assumption that that we're literally using reserves that we've been saving up specifically for this set of capital improvements? Mr. Chair, Council Member House, 
Yeah, the mayor. It's interesting. It's so, it's so direct, and I just, yeah, I'll take whatever you give me. It's, it's <laughs> the Harbor Preservation Fund, our fund 623, is actually our reserve for capital. So the, the funds for these projects are taken directly from the Harbor Preservation Fund. And so then that other chart that you showed us showing almost a, a, a steady as you go uh, level of capital reserves, this says that we're dipping into that, but I didn't, did I, I didn't think I saw it reflected up there. Am I mistaken? Uh, Why don't you put that slide up? Uh, Council Member uh, House, you, your perception is exactly correct. Each year we do not generate sufficient surplus revenues to fund our capital and operating um, program. So we have to dip into our um, reserve balances uh, to fund uh, those ongoing capital needs. We do a six-year pr projection, which Scott is going to sh show you and put up. And so what we do to make sure we have sufficient operating revenue surplus along with the use of reserves, along with our operating reserves, that over a sustained period of time, we still have sufficient funding to continue both the operation and the capital needs. Um, but our, our typical surplus is running right around a half a million to 700,000, and our capital needs each year are millions plus. So mm -hmm. each year we dip into those. So I think your perception is, okay. is and what then, you And then to the degree that we dip into that, or you, we all dip into that, um, at what point do you project us replenishing those reserves? <laughs> well, it, w w we don't show a replenishment of those reserves. We show that they are at the budgeted policy levels. Um, they're not below. Okay, so you're staying. So you got them up above the line, and now they're coming back down to the line, so to speak. Well, they, we'll they maintain again. They go up and they go down to a degree. You look at the six-year one. You look in uh, fiscal year 13. Our Harbor Preservation Fund goes from 07 at $4 million down to about $2 million. So it's dipped. But again, that's a fairly long out-year projection for us. I, mm -hmm. I'd hazard to tell you that I think sure. probably we'll be better than that come okay. 2013. But you're required because to keep $2 million in there, or 2.5. That's our minimum, $2, two. Million. Okay. But our overall balance has, again, dropped from about six to four. I'm starting to understand the process a little bit better. I just, um, I, it seems like with only half a million dollars every year in a surplus or in that neighborhood, at some point we're going to have to change the course or we hit the rocks, right? Okay. Mr. Um, Mr. Reedman. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Something. Yeah. If I may, uh, Council Member House, the other thing that you're not seeing here that I alluded to several times is a rather large loan from the Department of Boating and Waterways. Oh, mm -hmm. that's right. So there will be money infused into our capital program as we move along, and that will come out in the form of increased debt service. But we're talking about anywhere in the neighborhood of three mil three and a half million dollars to $6 million being infused into this as we move forward with the marina So that helps project. with, if you will, the cash flow in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of amortizing the... the the capital. And it requirement. keeps our reserves within the required levels. Right. Okay. Two other questions then. Um, one uh, kind of a small one. It's on page G329. Get back to that real quick. Under the um, administrative and community administration, uh, administrative support and community relations part, there's just this one line. I hate to nitpick, but I'm just curious about it. And that was the supplies and services expenditure um, going from 2007 at 756000 with about a 52% increase, or I mean a good healthy increase to 1.1 million, 1.165 million, and uh, and then stay and then it stays there. So it's not just a blip. Um, what would what would what would make a something administrative like supplies and services, not salaries and benefits? I mean, have that kind of a jump. What? I hate to get down to that level, but I am just kind of curious because that's a about 400. Or a little over four hundred thousand dollar jump, and then it stays up there from here on out. Was there a change in our procedure or process? Or actually, if you look back um, to the actuals in '06 and '07, it's just it's slowly climbing. But the uh, and I, I understand the projection for that's the one end of, the of this few year. numbers in the entire and all of everything that we have here that makes that kind of a jump, except the salaries, which you've already explained. And I was just curious. That's all. It, it, mm -hmm. it that what the changes or what what's now reflected is the allocated cost increase that we 
I think identified for you that uh, have been moved into that line item. So the ones that go to the other departments of the city, you mean? Allocated costs? Mm -hmm. That's where it's funded out of. So then that's reimbursed then from the other departments back in? In other words, this, is this where it just shows up as a cost and then? Yes. Yeah. I don't think there's where do a reimbursement back. Out, okay. Back, back. I mean, we're an enterprise fund, so I don't think that matters okay. where. Well, I'm interested. I'm sort of interested in that kind of a jump. It would just it just would raise an eyebrow. I mean, that 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 there's an awful lot of paper being used for copying or something. No, trust me, that's not the case. It's an, it's the additional allocated costs put on that program that reflect an increase in in that program. So I guess that's be the be the best way for me to explain it to you. Okay. All right. Then on the slip fees, I just had a question. You're using a 2% number instead of a cost of living increase that we use pretty much for any other rental in town. Is there any reason why you don't just index to the cost of living increase? I know it would be higher, but we're still lower than any other harbor. Um, first, I mean, it's the risk of causing World War III to break out. <laughs> well, that would be one. Um, <clears throat> the second one would be basically a policy decision that uh, the Harbor Master Plan has in it, that slip fees are the last fee to be adjusted based on what the needs are. So that we're, we're functioning on a policy directive um, that you adjust all your landside fees or your lease revenue fees before you go to slip fees. Okay. The second thing that I think we have purposely done is kept our slip fees relatively low. If for some reason we do not receive our dredge funding, which is paid for by the federal government, we will need to go to the slip holders to pay for uh, that um, significant cost, shall I say, a million, million and a half dollars. The second thing that we will probably be expected to do with the Department of Boating and Waterways loan is adjust our fees upwards to uh, cover the loan differential or loan coverage, so to speak, uh, on that uh, $6 million loan. This gives us that flexibility um, that we can easily justify. If we're going to the slip holders to rebuild their slips, Marina One, I think they can see the direct correlation. There's a direct go, nexus there between correct, the right? Correct. So I think to a degree they are held somewhat artificially low for the elasticity should we have the need in the future. My worry was just the one you had articulated, which was by holding them artificially low, even though you're continuing to increase a little bit at a time, you're setting up a, a kind of a balloon moment, you know, in the future where it's going to have to jump. And the earlier you bite that bullet, it would seem the better. But My, my fear would be that if we we – adjust them and then we don't have the balloon, the money somehow will have gotten spent and we will still have to continue to increase it beyond. That's interesting. You know, the Downtown Parking Committee established a sinking fund, basically, um, and that was their method of, of dealing with something like that, anticipating the increased maintenance in the, in the um, facilities for the parking garages and such. And so they're beginning to fund that now, even not knowing exactly, exactly where it's going to go. So just something to think about is the sooner that we can get that going, the better. And maybe there is a way to actually divert it and hold it aside. Anyway, just a thought. Okay. Um, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. And then Mr. Barno. So just so I'm clear of what Mr. House was saying earlier on back on 329, the supplies and services, services count as the overhead that goes back to the general fund. Is that what's part of what services are I believe that's true is that what is that what was said yes. yeah. that that is a service I'll, I'll let the finance director okay. confirm and i guess i didn't do a bit of <laughs> no i, I think you did I, th I just I, I think i got yeah. it i just wanted Ma madam mayor council member schneider actually i do want to make one clarification bob pearson finance director and that is that the vast majority of those allocated costs do not go to the general fund. The only piece that goes to the general fund is the overhead allocation itself, the right. generic overhead allocation. All the other services, whether it's information systems or vehicle maintenance, vehicle rent, risk management, all of those other things go to other city enterprise or internal service funds. They are indeed allocated costs, and they're costs over which the waterfront, as all departments, have little or no control. Um, but they don't go to the general fund. But yes, they're accounted for in the supplies and services That's category. The of the service. That's okay. correct. That, that clarifies things. Um, my other question, page 335, back to parking. The 
collection envelopes collected, is that when people are dishonorable in the honor lots and you have to follow mm -hmm. up with them? Is that what that's referring to? Oh, no. Madam yeah. Mayor, Council right Member Schneider, that is correct. Okay. The, when they pay the, the uh, collection envelope within a 10-day period, it comes back to the Waterfront Department and there's no further action. If they don't pay, it goes off to the Police Department. They tag on a $20 charge. And if they still don't pay, it goes to DMV and they can't. They have to pick pay it to uh, re-register their vehicle. Okay, so the other, thank you. So the tickets, that's when you have a kiosk with someone giving out a ticket. So the, where, where in, is there a, there's no P, so there is no P3 here looking at people participating in the honor lot or how many people park there. Is that, so I'm just, mis, I'm not seeing that and that's, um, I'm not supposed to see it. It's not there. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I was just, because that answers my question. Thank you. Got it. Okay, Mr. Brangle. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we don't know the percentage of success of the honor lots. Is that what you're saying? And, and I, or are we not I, tracking that? I think the we, question is, do we track it? And yeah. the answer is um, no. We don't necessarily track how many people are using it. We know how much revenue is generated by the honor fee lots. I mean, we can provide that information to you. We we before had a tracking uh, system for the 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 tick the, not the tickets the collection envelopes to find out how many collection envelopes we're actually getting back and how many people are paying how many people go into the system that type of thing that was what we did we, we found that out we don't know that it's necessarily that much value to us to continue to track it so that's why it's being deleted so well you mean when we tracked it we found out that the program was working or we found it wasn't working or what, what did we find? I mean, an honor system is one of those things where you want to be sure that it, it's working, right? How do we know that as a percentage of success? Um, based on the information we collected on the uh, collection envelopes, we're getting a, a majority of the people get the envelope and pay it. Okay. Um, I think probably somewhere in the magnitude of 10 to 15 percent go into the other system, which means you better pay it or you're going to pay more money than okay. you would have been just to send us the check back. Okay. Um, a couple of questions on, I'm reading this correctly, that the slip income is almost a million dollars more than the land lease and wharf lease income. Is that correct? When I look at it's combined. Um, like three million versus four million, or something like that. Is that about it's, right? It's um, it's more, but it's not just slip income. It's um, visitor fee income. Oh, okay. A visitor come each and every day and have a transient birth. The okay. other one is the slip transfer income that okay. get when people transfer their slip. I think when you looked at slip fee to to lease revenue, they're about the same, if I remember right. They're about three million dollars. Okay. About the same. Um, Mr. Williams' uh, comment about the temporary hourly versus uh, permanent, is any of that related to st storm-related cleanup? Because it seems to me like after we have storms, we have people out there that aren't normally on site. I think we might even have Work Inc. Is that another outfit that helps us clean it during and after storms or no? And, and to what? how do we pay them? Are they hourly? Um, Councilman Barnwell, they're on a contract, an annual contract. contract okay. Um, they don't necessarily participate in storm cleanup. They may have some additional work um, per their shift, uh, but we wouldn't bring them on separate. Okay. Uh, and there are, that's about a two hundred and forty thousand dollar year contract for us, work okay. incorporated. So that's that's different. Separate. That. Okay. Um, yes, we would bring in a temporary for some type of uh, storm cleanup or special project, especially. Um, debris uh, cleanup, that type of thing. Um, I don't think it's the majority of the hours. I think okay. uh, they are somewhat routine shift hours or special project hours. Uh, if we're going to rebuild Marina 2, uh, redeck it or something, we would bring uh, hourlies on to assist the, uh, the maintenance crew. Okay. Um, the sunken beach boats allocation. Uh, which I just lost the page of. We were anticipating, due to the new uh, moorage at Fools Harbor, that we're going to drop. But I was wondering, it's on page G339, how much in the budget and where in the budget do we allocate for the cost? I know that we're supposed to get reimbursed by whoever's boat is beached or whoever's boat sinks, but we often do not, just by the nature of a sailor who can't keep up his boat 
he's sure not going to be able to pay for the cleanup. Do do we pull that out of reserves when we go out and spend the thirty thousand or ten thousand or whatever it is? Um, Councilman Barnwell, uh, kind of a combination of things. We've recently, over the last two or three years, got a grant uh, from the Department of Boating and Waterways, somewhere in the fifty to a hundred thousand dollar range, that has been um, used to to pay the costs associated with abandoned boats or beach boats. Uh, we get uh, ninety percent of that cost covered, so ten percent of it we are at risk if we don't get from the boat owner. We don't typically tell the boat owner that up front. Right. Um, we tell them they owe us. Um, we put them on a payment plan. If they, you know, fail to pay, then we're more or less out that money. But I would point out that that's a combination of the waterfront department pays those costs and the park and recreation department uh -huh. because parks is often involved in the beach cleanup aspect okay. of it with their dozers and their pe okay. uh, their um, their staff. So it's a okay. it's a combination. Um. I didn't hear any mention of, but we've talked about it sometimes in long-range planning, of the costs associated with breakwater lights. Are, are they in our projections? <laughs> Funny look on your face there. <laughs> is, is this a little pipe dream we all kind of kid ourselves on? Or, or well, I, I certainly hope not. Um, we've had it budgeted. Uh, we took it out of the budget because we couldn't necessarily get the right project funded and approved and put on the breakwater. So. Uh, I think I've mentioned this uh, before that we're looking at a different approach from a lighting standard standpoint of what will be acceptable to an electrical engineer to have installed and put in. It's not in here. The, the quarter million dollars or, or the cost to implement it is not currently on the budget. It was, but it, it right. came and went. So if and when we can get the engineer's approval for the type of lighting, uh, I think I can with confidence tell you the Harbor Commission's interest and the department's interest to find the money and then install okay. the lighting. And we've, or, or have we plumbed the, the new breakwater and wall to handle mm -hmm. that? Another good question. I'm not laughing. I'm just, you, you've anticipated the same issues. The difficulty is um, that project isn't all going to be completed at the same time. To put it only in the sections that will be completed would tell you we can't really then implement it till almost 2013, which is when we anticipate finishing the breakwater. I would like to think we can find a way to do it without having to plummet or, or okay. put the conduit within the sidewalk um, per se, and that's okay. what we're looking at doing. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Williams. This is Madam Mayor. Had me get my toughest question out of the way early. Um, I only have nice questions, I think. Um, one is uh, your P3. Uh, your P3 goals are awesome. I mean, you, the level of detail I, I find that you put into it and the level of, uh, I would say, um, uh, realism in it. It seems to reflect some logic. Like, I always look at these things, and sometimes I don't think year to year, uh, sometimes people don't adjust for what has changed in the last year. They just keep to the same goal. And there seems to be um, logic to, to, to your goals and detail in them. So I really appreciate that. Um, the on, 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 uh, on revenue side um, issues, are there some barriers to um, uh, sort of slip foot, uh, a slip fee like revenue coming from actual tie-ups to the wharf itself. This is an idea who, that's come up um, more recently for large vessels. Yeah, Stearns. Um, is, is there some technical issues that would be a barrier to that? Um, uh, or is that a potential place for revenue growth for the, for the, for the, uh, um, the harbor? I guess I can answer two ways. The first is we do have in our fee resolution what we call uh, wharfage and dockage. So any vessel that ties up to whether it's the Navy Pier um, in the harbor or the wharf itself, we can assess a fee depending upon how long they're staying and what their activity is. Um, I, I wasn't sure though whether the question was just relative to any type of vessel or on the wharf, obviously the only type that would typically tie up would be a large vessel for a relatively short period of time. But if 
you know, a 150, 180, 200 foot schooner came alongside and wanted to use the wharf for a period of time, um, we could we have a mechanism in the fee resolution to charge a fee. Meaning so we would not need a policy change to do something like that. Not at all. Okay. And then um, uh, when I looked at some of your citation P3 objectives, and I was wondering if we could get um, that broke broke uh, a constituent piece broken out for us, which is citations of off leash violations um, at some point. Um, just broken out out from that, those, and then the last thing is uh, solar solar on the on the bathroom. I think that's great. Um, what about? I mean, the the two lease the 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 two business leases um, roof spaces that you're going to need to do roof replacements. Isn't that larger a larger space than the the bathroom, and it doesn't have that have a potential for? Um, scalability to to look at. Have you guys looked at that? Are you going to look at that? Um, the answer is yes. In terms of scalability, it's certainly different. I think we were looking to see whether or not, with um, the um, restroom project, whether or not it really works for us. Whether there's a cost benefit analysis and how it would benefit us in the long run. The two buildings that we're talking about, one in particular, the 117 building, um, is very old. And I think when we begin to think about how we would convert the solar energy into that building, it would cost us more than it probably would benefit us, at least with the 117. So I think it really depends upon the application of what the solar will be used for within that building. Um, so I think 117 may be problematic. 125, there, it, there may be. I, I don't think we've looked at it, but we certainly can. I don't think the roofing would probably preclude it from going forward in the future, because um, I think any application, these will be panels that sit on the roof. They wouldn't necessarily um, be built into the actual roof product itself. Well, sometimes you can save costs by doing it at the same time, but I, I, you know, I think. It makes sense to to step into it uh, with just your toes, but the only problem with that is, you know, when you do the smallest solar project possible, your capital costs are really low, but your cost benefit ratio is automatically going to be as worth, as bad as it can be because the 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 return by cost for a larger solar system is always is always better. So if you're going to evaluate on a cost benefit ratio. Then using as your litmus test your, uh, your one of your smallest buildings, I don't know if that's a good way to, to to analyze the viability of future projects. And it might be better to look at a larger system if that's going to be sort of the the litmus test or the the uh, the test for future projects in the in the harbor. Okay. Again, I'm sorry if I implied that would be the litmus test. I, I think I meant for the application. In the restrooms, if we can provide hot water and heat, which we provide in those two facilities with solar panels, why shouldn't we do that with all our restroom buildings? Right. It's a good idea. It works well. And if it, even if it generates more power than we need there, we can plow it into the system and use it for the marinas. Um, that wasn't necessarily what we were intending to do for Marina, or I'm sorry, for the those two buildings, uh, 117 and 125. I'll ask my facilities staff to look at if we're going to do that. Would number one, it preclude anything in the future for a solar system? But I don't think we were thinking for solar to power or provide sources of energy for those two buildings separate. So it's not a litmus test overall. Just just to really look at those marina restrooms that I think we could maybe make this application work for all of them. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we go on to the airport and we get to grill them. <laughs> that was a long one. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to save my, my question of, of when we're going to have private surf days for staff and uh, council <laughs> members at Sandspit. But. There you go. Felt like we were a little rough on them. You know, I mean, we have to ask our questions. I know. Well, the waterfront's always um, complicated to me. I know I'm on. 
the job. Was it? Yeah, he, he configured them in different ways. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Johns, you're going to do this? I see. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. I'm Hazel Johns, the Assistant Airport Director, and I'll be presenting the uh, airport's fiscal year 2008 budget for your consideration. The mission of the airport is to provide safe, modern, and convenient facilities for the traveling public to access the national air transportation system. The airport has 54 full-time employees in four major divisions, administration, business and property management, certification and operations, and facilities planning and development. The other seven programs are equally important and support the four divisions. Today's budget review will include a discussion on the operational budget, identification of initiatives and projects for next year, programmatic changes within the department, a proposed parking fee adjustment, a summary of next year's capital improvement program, and a review of the department's expanded P3s. In preparing the budget, we keep in mind that federal law requires that all revenues generated on the airport are to be used for the operation, maintenance, and capital improvement of the airport. Expenditures have been projected based on historical trends and anticipated operational activities. A major increase of approximately 27 percent in the parking program is a result of the implementation of the living wage ordinance. To enhance efficiency <laughs> and reduce expenditures, we are working with the parking management company on an equipment change which will allow customers to pay on foot. A more detailed report and analysis will be presented at a later date. This pie chart of the operational expenditures by object code reflects that the airport continues to be a capital intensive department with supplies and services exceeding salaries and benefits. This category includes maintenance contracts for new computer programs and certification and operations for the security program and also a new, a new noise flight track monitoring system. <laughs> Allocated costs also continue to increase as the expense for general fund services are distributed among departments. When costs are distributed by program, the maintenance division continues to lead the department in expenditures, followed closely by operations with the intra-department service agreement with the fire department for ARF, and then security, which has the largest number of staff. Revenues are based on forecasted rentals and user fees, taking into consideration land development negotiations in the commercial industrial area, completion of the runway safety area project, which requires night closure of the airfield, and completion of design for the new airline terminal project. With this in mind, we're projecting a 3.3 percent decrease in revenues from the projected fiscal year 2007 gear in estimates. This chart depicts the airport's revenue sources by line of business and percentage of total. Once again, as in 2006 and 7, the airline terminal concession revenues exceed the commercial industrial rentals. In preparing the budget, we looked at the next two years and identified initiatives and projects that would require time and resources. The major items were completing the runway safety area project, completing the design and permitting for the airline terminal improvement project, executing leases and commencing construction in the 15-acre commercial industrial parcel, development of a succession plan for the department, and incorporating and promoting sustainable policies and practices in our workplace and projects. We are also recommending some changes in the department's organization. 
recognizing the department's increased effort in environmental activities we are proposing a new program environmental compliance we propose to compile all costs for environmental maintenance monitoring and agency compliance into this new program by shifting personnel and specific line item cost this change will centralize activities and improve performance at no additional cost another change pertains to staffing We are proposing to eliminate an hourly position <laughs> and create a full-time <laughs> keyword, I guess, full-time permanent position in the marketing and communications program. Did you make that slide in the last 20 minutes? <laughs> I missed the whole discussion. <laughs> the hourly position has been included in our budget for more than 10 years, and the need for a permanent position has been well demonstrated. The increased costs for the position have been covered by decreasing expenditures in professional services fees, since this position will assume some of the tasks previously outsourced to consultants. The environmental compliance program will be located in cert certification and operations, and with the new position in marketing, the total number of full-time employees will increase to 55. In 1995, Airport Commission recommended that parking fees be evaluated on a routine basis and adjustments made according to, accordingly to avoid large single increases. With this in mind, we conducted a survey of Southern California airports to determine parking rates for short and long-term parking lots. The daily rates in the short-term range from $15 to $30, and in the long-term, the rates were $7 to $12 per day. The last airport parking adjustment was made in August of 2006, and based on the industry survey, the rising personnel costs due to the living wage ordinance, and to encourage alternative means of transportation, we are recommending changes to the short and long-term parking rates. We recommend that the 24-hour maximum rate in the short-term lot be increased from $16 to $17. The daily 24-hour rate in the long-term lot be increased from $8 to $9. That the weekly rate in the long-term lot be reduced from $48 to $45, allowing a two-free-day uh, period in a seven-day period, giving them two days free. And with these changes, we anticipate that our annual increase in revenues will be $220,000 in the parking revenues. If approved, these rates would be effective August 1, 2007, uh, allowing for a 30-day public information campaign on the rate change. Okay, we have a question on that slide. You want to go back one there? Mr. Williams. Do we have a contractual obligation with any of our vendors or anything else that would stop mm -hmm. us from eventually having smaller fees for the overflow lot? I mean, what? what why do we... Uh, you know, parking is not a, necessarily an entitlement for folks that work for us or work for our vendors. So w one of the reasons, why, one of the things that I've wondered about, because I know that you guys are having to figure out how are we going to pay for this terminal. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, why, why don't we charge at some level for the overflow flow lot, at least a smaller, you know, small charge for it. We do charge. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Mayor and what is Councilman that? Williams, we charge the same rate for the overflow lot as we do for the uh, long-term lot at the terminal, and we changed that a while back, a year or so ago, um, quite frankly because of the cost of providing the shuttle. It kind of exceeded what we had anticipated, and rather than having two different rates for long-term parking, we uh, decided to go ahead and charge the same dollar amount. And how many... Who, who gets free passes? Is it just us council members or who, who, you know, who gets free passes mm -hmm. out there? Is it the employees? The employee director doesn't get. <laughs> we don't get one. Really? Good. We don't. Do you get one? We used no. to. I don't get one. No, we used none to. of us do. Well, Doss. Well, Doss, you tell us your secret. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, nope. it's not a routine thing. Yeah. Good. It would be done by yeah. exception only. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. I mean, I, 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 I noticed that a lot of employees did go do that. Is that just because we encouraged them and they're being, they're being good to the airport by going out there 
rather than go into the long-term parking. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about public parking, visitors parking, not the, employee parking. I'm talking about the, the, the overflow, the, the employee parking and the overflow lot. That's what I'm specifically okay. referring to. The overflow to. lot with employees. You guys thought I was, oh. real, I was really sm smart and finagled something. I did. <laughs> no, I no, 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 no. how you did that. <laughs> employees okay. do employee not pay. Employee parking. Okay. That's different. That's when what we relocated question. them from the airline terminal, it was sort of a given that we would not charge them for parking since they make minimum wage anyway. Right. And, and, uh, and is that true of also our vendor employees? TSA employees? Yes, that's all employees at the terminal. We have probably, what, 450, 500 employees working there. So um, all of those folks who work at the airline terminal do not pay and park in the overflow lot and are shuttled back and forth. Yeah. And is that a contractual obligation? Because it seems to me like it's something inherently at odds with two things. One is our desire to make enough revenue to pay for a terminal that we're proud of in terms of sustainability and everything and it's also at odds with our sustainability goals of alternative transportation if we provide free parking to all of the vendors um, employees it's kind of hard to get them to take alternative transportation to work and you know I, I just I just want encourage you guys to look at that as one of the one of the ways to make this terminal project work. Um, I, I don't necessarily need to see it here because you guys are going to come with us with the terminal project proposal just a month or two from now anyway, mm -hmm. but I'd like you to look at that as a possibility. Certainly. Okay, capital. The airport capital program reflects projects based on anticipated funding. The capital program includes ongoing maintenance and repair for projects for the airport's physical assets, buildings, and facilities, two infrastructure projects, and the continued implementation of the aviation facilities plan projects. Funding sources for the capital program include reserves above policy, federal grants, and passenger and customer facility fees. Using reserves above policy, the airport has allocated $1.5 million in 2008 and approximately 1.69 million in 2009 for the capital program. Maintenance cost as construction for major repairs, roof replacements, street pavements have increased, the amount allocated for these necessary maintenance items has also grown. We are allocating $750,000 each year, which is a $100,000 increase over our prior years. The airport water system was upgraded more than 20 years ago. However, the main water line dead ends at Goleta Beach. This water line project will restore a loop in the system, creating improved fire protection capabilities, and will be located outside the airfield. The airport will reuse, the cost is $1.6 million for design and construction, and the airport will re use reserves above policy to fund the project over a three year period. The airport sewer system is more than 60 years old and is composed of a series of lift stations and pipelines crossing the airfield, terminating at the Glada Sanitary District. We've been working with the district on a joint project to construct a new lift station and gravity flow line. Sharing the facilities would reduce the airport's share of the proposed $5.3 million cost to approximately $2.7 million, or 51%. The city's program for measuring efficiencies and effectiveness of department work product is the P3 program. Under the city's sustainability program, each program within the department has identified measurable sustainable objectives. <laughs> in administration, strategies will be developed and implemented along with an employee education program to meet sustainable objectives. The objectives include exploring opportunities to generate renewable energy sources, purchase of alternative fuels or hybrid vehicles, achieving a 5% electric energy reduction, reducing paper use by 5%, and reducing employee auto commute trips by 10% by using alternative work programs. We will also educate and promote the sustainable program to airport tenants and the marketing communications program will inform the public of the airport's sustainable efforts and achievements. 
We will also incorporate greening techniques in building remodels and will investigate the use of LED lights for the airfield. Airport Patrol will try using an alternative fuel hybrid vehicle. Certification will work with the ARF and the fire department to explore better stormwater practices and will implement new stormwater best management practices from the recently completed uh, update, updated plan. Facilities planning and development will promote green design in all airport projects. In closing, I'd like to add that on March 21st, the Airport Commission reviewed the department's budget, budget and recommended its approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Um, Williams. Yes. I just uh, wanted to tell you that I, I can't stay for any of the questions because I got a bike to a comb meeting, <laughs> and that's going to take a while <laughs> and be really tough today. So, um, yeah. uh, no, uh, to <laughs> Laurel, Laurel Canyon near our, our cater, yeah. cater, uh, cater treatment plan. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, quest <laughs> <laughs> questions, Mr. Barnwell? Mayor, Mayor. Sure. A couple things. <clears throat> think, think, uh, great report, by the way. Thank yeah. you very much. A lot of good stuff being done out there. Kudos, etc. The investigate the LED lights. Kind of, kind of a little mushy in the word investigate. What what are we going to do there? Because I know the LED lights on our traffic signals reduce the cost by something like eighty five percent, according to Michael Grimes. <laughs> so. How can we actually, and what are, how do we intend to investigate? What's the plan? What that really means is, um, number one, making sure it's FAA approved, and then the second part is just including it in a grant application. Okay. Okay. So it's not, if FAA approves it, we'll just include it in our okay. grant. Okay. Um, and the second one is, I, I noticed a, a um, and you're, your, every department has been doing this. The idea of solar, we keep talking about solar, without differentiating between necessarily between solar hot water and solar photovoltaic. Have you done that in your investigations to find out where it is that maybe it could, it's easy to do the solar hot water, maybe really expensive to do the photovoltaic? Are, are you differentiating in that way in your investigations of where it will fit? We haven't done anything in detail. First, what we'll do is get a kind of generalized program and some guidelines for our department to guide our maintenance and remodels and so forth. So that'll be part of, um, you know, developing more specific strategies. Okay. It, it just in, it, and I'm not necessarily even speaking of your new, your new terminal facility. I'm just talking about every, everything right. out there at the airport. Okay. And then lastly, this is just a little kind of a pet thing of my own, but when we took our tour of the airport a few months ago, you showed us the the uh, the viewing facilities down where the old uh, airport motel used to be, which is a you know it wasn't particularly visually attractive. We've got like an eight foot high chain link fence, and then that little rectangular area where you could stand. But there was no real way to look. You just you were looking through the fence to look out and see the birds and things. Um, and there was some discussion, most of it by myself, about. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I took notes. No. Uh, <laughs> um, the idea that maybe we could put a viewing stand there. We would remove it from the fence so that you don't use the viewing stand to jump over the top of the fence. Um, to what degree are we looking at that and to what degree are we setting money aside for those other, uh, uh, what do I call them, viewing spots that we have in our capital plan. I, I don't hear any, I, I, I keep I keep just talking about this because I think it's important. We um, actually are not looking at a viewing stand. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we will at some point. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how you would incorporate it into the, it's such a small little spot. Um, the other ones, what about the ones along Hollister, uh, along Hollister and or maybe along uh, Los Carneros? Are, are, to what degree are we still planning for those facilities where the public can park and look out across our new uh, bird tidal slough renovations? Yeah, really the only um, place that would probably be the best place is near the corner of Los Carneros and Hollister. But now the fence goes up pretty close to the, the street. Um, we kind of have to look. I'd have to look at it and see. That's really probably the best viewing point. 
or actually any, standing anywhere on the kind of footpath on Hollister, you know, you can see better now since the uh, vegetation has been removed. Well, okay, I didn't see any money allocated for it, and I, it is something we used to talk about, and then we put some fences up, and then what we thought we were going to do, we didn't do, but I, I just want to keep well, bringing I, it up every once in a while. I think that what our past discussions, the viewing area got moved to where the old motel was. We did talk about the corner of Hollister and Fairview. Yeah. Uh, well, not it, Hollister and Fairview. Hollister, Hollister and Los Carneros. Hmm. Well, then all the more reason why I let's. I think we need to polish the stone there at that one by the airport motel. Thank you, Madam uh, Mayor, and a good report. Thank you very much. Looking forward to all that stuff. Okay, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. Um, thank uh, thank you for uh, acknowledging the. Temporary to regular is the term. I, I even think we passed a resolution recently changing mm -hmm. all those terms from permanent to regular. Um, but that was, it's always great to see that kind of uh, looking, looking at that and, and good for marketing and especially with the new terminal coming up, you're going to need to reach out to the public quite a bit. Um, as, as also as you look into the parking, um, new ways of parking revenues or operations in terms of reducing costs and increasing efficiency. Uh, Burbank Airport, which I know we compare ourselves to in fees and so forth, has, a, I think, a very uh, successful valet parking process, and, and it obviously costs more for the service of it, but it might be another way. And, and I was even thinking, especially during the terminal construction, um, if parking is going to become a kind of dicey issue in terms of where you can park and, you know, and capacity and so forth, that that might be a revenue source and something into the future and a service that I think has worked well, at least at Burbank and probably others, that maybe to look at. Um, I have a question on P3s on G27, two of them. One, you have over 100 percent on percentage of compliance with TSA perimeter security inspection requirements. How do you do better than, how do you get extra credit, I guess? <laughs> how do you get over 100% on compliance? How does that work? Just some additional controls. So you, you're doing more than they ask, is that what you're saying? We're able to do more than their minimum required their amount minimum of patrols, okay. yes. So you're going beyond their minimum requirements. Okay, and then on the same page, down a little bit, access control system alarms. <laughs> you go from 705,000 to 228,000 to 85,000. Can you comment on what that is and how the, the and the dramatic decrease? Yes, I can. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Lincoln. <laughs> Please do. The 705,000 was during the construction period when part of the system was up and there was just alarms going every which way while we were bringing it online. Uh, 205,000 was, I believe, what we project for the end of this year to where we've been able to get the users trained. Um, to back up for one moment to define an alarm, it's uh, many, many things can cause an alarm to occur as the number would indicate, but anytime anybody uses their badge incorrectly, it causes an alarm or they just by mistake hold a door open a little too long because they've stopped to speak with someone. So we've put a tenant education program together. We're already seeing success with the end of construction, uh, the reduced number of user errors, and our ability to speak with the TSA about what they need to find as an alarm. We've been able to reduce it significantly. And I know it looks high, but if Airports all over the country have these insanely high numbers of alarms because you've got a, you know, hundreds to a thousand employees walking around using badges at a couple of hundred portals a day, all day long, all night long. So everybody, every time they slip up a little, you get a little computer okay. alarm I'm blip. So glad to see the trend going down. The people who work in the SSC Good. are very, so very an educational pleased. Educational piece. Okay. Yes. And my final, I'm not quite sure if this is a budget issue or just a general related airport issue. Um, two weeks ago, the city of Goleta approved the Cabrillo Business Park, which is right across Los Caneros from the airport. And just curious about how that interacts with the airport and also with any noise um, abatement agreements, things like that. I know we've done that with other residential um, projects near the airport. And it's not quite a budget issue, but I thought it's timely. So here you are. Yeah, right. We uh, have worked with the Saris Regis Cabrillo Business Park project since um, actually before Goleta became a city. 
and um, came to an agreement with the property owner. We actually pur purchased an easement on the open uh, piece of land on that parcel to more or less dictate the kind of uses that they could have and also the relocation of the uh, runway uh, lighting for our runway project. When Galita became a city, they can, their staff continued to work with us. We have an easement over all the of the uh, property, a, a noise easement. So um, we're great. For that. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. House. Thank you very much. As the uh, liaison to the airport commission, I, I I appreciate that you've covered all this stuff, you know, with the uh, board and so thoroughly. And um, so it's, it's kind of familiar territory. The two things I just wanted to comment on, both of them have to do with more of the capital side of things. Is this, uh, let's see, total estimated value of projects in active design and construction, $108 million or something. It's a large number with the terminal coming up. and. Um, so the related piece to that has to do with the key objective, which has to do with uh, achieving the total annual construction contract bid average within 10 percent and uh, the other one having to do limit the uh, annual value of construction contract change orders, um, et cetera. You know, the idea being to really manage for those construction costs. And we've heard so much lately of private developers um, uh, um, just getting themselves in a hole because of unexpected, unanticipated costs. And it's different from your operating budget, I recognize, so I'm just bringing this up because it's in front of me right now. But um, uh, to what degree, then, in terms of operating, do you anticipate a need to either beef up your staff or to um, strengthen your ability to um, to uh, verify the, the the costs that are being told, that we're being told um, will be coming. In other words, uh, you've got your, uh, um, your the terminal coming up, for instance, and we've already had to make a couple of revisions to its design based on increasing costs, even at this early stage. Um, how do we how do we take control of that, if at all? It, do you have any anything in anybody assigned to that to be attempting to manage the um, uh, for that to um, to double check, triple check figures, look for competing something? I mean. How do we manage? Is there any way for us to manage that? Or are we just totally at the effect of the market? And talk to me about that. Well, and That's a lot of money because a small percentage could really tip the whole thing, That's right? right. Okay. That's right. That's uh, right. Kind of two things. Uh, there are cost escalators built into the the project's budget or cost estimates, mm -hmm. so that we try and keep ahead of both regular inflation and construction inflation, but also the um, HNTB, our um, design um, people for the, con for the terminal, uh, have a cost estimator that is updating our, co our cost estimate as we go along and refining it. And um, I have a lot of faith in the work that, that this company has done. Uh, that's all that they do. and. Um, She's, you know, keeps us, and of course it just depends on how the specificity of design detail, mm -hmm. you know, to keep refining it. But we do keep refining it, and we do keep looking at what our cost escalators are and contingencies are, so that hopefully at the end the idea is to be on budget. Is the cost of that service um, part of the capital cost of the new terminal, or is it part of an operating expense that shows up here? It's, par it's part of the uh, Terminal project. Part of the cost. terminal project. I right. see. Okay. So it's built into it. And then there's no other oversight internally that we're doing to kind of like triple check it, right? You just, we have faith. Other than our uh, public works engineering staff that's, you know, managing the project also. Okay. So that cooperation with our public works folks, right. the building department and such. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Horton. And then we'll be just fire. three short ones on uh, G19. Um, your occupancy rate is is 95 percent the, the your, your sort of optimum goal because of the number of units you're going to have in flux. And I don't have any problem with that. I'm just interested if that's as as close to 100 percent as you think you can get. Councilman Horton, um, part of the reason why that's down a touch is because of the uh, negotiations for the 15-acre parcel. So we'll lose some of the building space yeah. that we have, and so we're knocking that down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Other buildings on the airport, though, are, are really um, occupied. 
Does okay. it make sense? Yeah, it On 25, um, the carriers aren't cleaning the ramps anymore. Is that because if they don't get dirty anymore or we just don't clean them anymore? <laughs> I'll have Tracy answer that one. That's the sweeping and cleaning of the ramps. That's the air carrier ramp. The air, the air carriers never clean the ramp. We always do, do. But now we've set goals because it's our stormwater permit to make All sure right. we um, do it on a frequent basis. But it's a lot less than you used to. <laughs> Not more. Tracy? We do a better job of cleaning it. We have a steam cleaner and... Uh, we apply some degreaser and we pick it all up and dump it in the oil water separator. So, so it's once a quarter now, roughly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. On 29, um, when I was at UCSB, the noise complaints used to be just ferocious. Mm -hmm. I see they're um, they've gone up substantially. It, is that a fun? I thought the jets were getting quieter and noisier. What What is the issue? Our most recent 12 months, we had the lowest number of noise complaints that we've ever um, ever had in the past 10 years. The reason there's an increased number here is because when we put out a few press releases regarding our new flight tracking and noise monitoring system, we will begin to receive calls because whenever you um, bring that issue up, um, the number of calls just goes up. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. No other, yes. I had one last question. Sure. On page G21, it says that I noticed that the percent of news releases eliciting media coverage has gone down. Is that due to the death throes of the news press or oh, some sorry. other some other contributing factor there? <laughs> <laughs> this is a question asked frequently of the uh, marketing coordinator. She's hesitant to do 100% because if just one news release is not picked up by uh, a media, then she uh, slips below her target. So uh, during oh, okay. our uh, okay. meeting with the city administrator, he urged us to take advantage of last-minute corrections on the P3s. Okay. That will take place before the end of the year. Gotcha. All right. Thank you very much. appreciate it. That eagle eye burn well, huh? <laughs> Pretty obvious. Ah, Ms. Schneider is sitting there. And then you got him to ask the question. Very clever of you. He makes his own. I know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, fire is next. Mm -hmm. I know. I've got a, and I sit in here and I remember it and I go in my office and forget it. So I've got to. You get ask him on the air, basically. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Bloom and uh, yes. Council Members, uh, Ron Prince, Chief. Fire Chief. Uh, today it's our pleasure to present our uh, uh, recommended budget for fiscal year 08. Um, our presentation, we can probably do it in 10 minutes. Uh, Perfect. And uh, has four parts. The first part is just for me to describe our organization, major program areas. Second part, I'll ask Administrative Services Manager Pete Ramsdell to do, go over the financial uh, aspects, the projected revenues and expenditures for 08. And then it will be back to me for a minute if we have time to talk about some key projects and initiatives. Okay. And then uh, I'd like to close with uh, Deputy Chief Mitch Vaughn talking about uh, some of our, uh, a few of our P3 highlights. So as we go through these, uh, any of this information, um, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, just quickly, these are all of our major program areas. Of course, administration responsible for policy and, and uh, planning and, and budget administration. Our, our two newest divisions here that uh, are probably of most interest are the, the Wildland Program underneath the Fire Prevention Bureau, 
Uh, that's got two folks in it that are working exclusively on wildland fire mitigation projects. The other big division or program area is emergency services, which we just initiated this last year um, from the police department, and uh, it's been going pretty well. They're, they're spinning up, and we'll go into some detail about all these programs in a, in a minute. But that's our basic organizational structure. Hasn't changed much. Uh, uh, except for those two new programs that uh, have been evolving over time. This is just a further breakdown of our uh, programs and assignments of, within all those uh, program areas I mentioned. And I won't go into any detail here, but this just shows basically the, the paramilitary organization that we have <laughs> in, the, uh, in the fire department. And the p positions per program, this just shows you uh, an interesting fact, and that is that uh, if you add up the airport rescue and firefighter group of nine folks and then the 88 folks in operations, that's a, that is a huge percentage. We're really a combat department if you look at it that way. 97% of our, or 97 of our folks are operations shift folks, and 18 remaining folks work uh, either in prevention or administration. So we have a very labor intensive uh, organization. It's mostly uh, operational folks that work on 24-hour shifts, and uh, that's been the way uh, it's been for many, many years. It's a very, very labor-intensive organization. The, uh, the next slide I'll ask Pete to go over, and uh, we did review our budget, by the way, with uh, the Fire and Police Commission last week during their last meeting, and uh, they, they looked at it and, and uh, smiled, so I guess that was a good mm -hmm. sign. So, Pete, take it away. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm Pete Ramsdell, the Administrative Services Manager for the Fire Department. Um, we wanted to start by telling you about our budget by program. And again, you'll see it's, it's pretty much um, top heavy in terms of the 24-7 emergency response programs. Um, we have 78% of the budget is dedicated to the operations program and then another 8% to the ARF program. So that's a total of 86% of our budget is specifically designated for the 24-7 emergency response. Uh, and you can see the other programs in there, um, while still very important, um, we just don't spend that much money on them. We get a lot of bang for our buck. Um, and, and again, we're beating a dead horse here, but as you can see, uh, People is the name of the game in the fire department. 86.8% .8 of uh, our costs are salary and benefits. Um, the 9% allocated costs are probably about 50% of those go to salary and benefits of uh, ICS departments in the city that support us in terms of uh, building maintenance, vehicle maintenance, computer maintenance, and those kind of costs. Um, for the first time this year, we're also budgeting in the allocated costs money for emergency generator replacement and the mobile data computer replacement. Now here's a, a graphic that uh, all the departments were asked to show. For, for us, this is somewhat uh, not telling you the real story because of our amended budget. Our amended budget is actually higher in this current year than our proposed budget for next year. And so we're not that good. We're not going to be able to save you 2.2%. Wow. Um, but what we will do, we'll, what we'll show you here is the reason the amended budget is so high is because at mid-year uh, you appropriated a million and seventy thousand, almost a million seventy-one thousand dollars to us for to cover the mutual aid costs we incurred uh, over the fire season. Um, Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that were actually direct costs that we needed to reimburse our budget for. About three hundred thousand dollars of that we were able to fund um, new projects or special projects. We didn't do any ongoing funding with that just because we never know um, that we're going to get that much. This is an unusual year. Um, but some of the things we, we were able to fund were a $150,000 equipment replacement fund, uh, a vehicle for the OES program, and uh, $60,000 to upgrade our fire radio system. Um, now on the revenue side, um, the, uh, yeah, the previous speakers um, are responsible for most of our revenue, as you can see. Um, the airport <laughs> is giving us a million and a half dollars, a little more than a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. Then the next highest number is mutual aid. And um, we wanted to, to let you know that this year we've increased our mutual aid revenue estimate by about $100,000. Um, we're fairly comfortable. We can live with that. 
because um, of the, the history we've had over the last five years, we've done at least a half a million dollars worth of mutual aid every year. So we're using um, this new number now, and what that allows us to do is, is to budget some uh, sorely needed uh, material supplies increases. We want to talk a little bit about the wildland program. So far, we've only talked about the general fund. Um, the wildland program includes uh, money from the general fund as well as from the new wildland fire benefit assessment fund. And so now we have a total funding for that program of 403000 almost $404,000. Uh, and we're able to do, as you'll see later in the presentation, some very significant um, progress in the high fire hazard area. The expenditures in the Wildland Fire Benefit Assessment Fund um, are, they look different from the rest of our pie charts. Salaries and benefits are only 34% of this particular um, fund because most of the money is going to the special projects and these are actual um, physical activities up there in the high fire hazard area like um, vegetation management, um, road clearance, and defensible space uh, management. And you'll, again, he'll hear more about that. Um, shortly. Um, some of the highlights, we mentioned the increases in uh, mutual aid revenue. Um, our expenditure target was increased to cover the mobile data computers and emergency generator uh, replacement program. We haven't done that up till this year and uh, we haven't had the mo mobile data computers um, and uh, up until this year uh, emergency generators were just replaced when they broke. Um, we were also able to increase our fuel costs or our fuel budget um, for the drastically increased fuel costs that we are experiencing, um, as well as our utilities and, and our, the OES program. Um, I wanted to mention too for utilities, we've, you've talked about solar a lot today. Um, we were able to reduce the increase in utilities that we budgeted for electricity because we expect the solar uh, photovoltaic solar project at Station 2 to be online by this fiscal year, uh, this coming fiscal year, and uh, we expect that to save us in the neighborhood of two to three thousand dollars. Thanks, Pete. Uh, just quickly, uh, the, some of the key projects and initiatives that we plan to be working on uh, this next fiscal year is the Station 1 seismic renovation project. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail on these in a second, but I just wanted to cover these bullets. Uh, the wildland fire mitigation projects, uh, we're going to focus on a lot of uh, new disaster preparedness initiatives. Uh, computer to dispatch system integration, and that really means the uh, installation of the mobile data computers and all the fire trucks and how we're going to integrate with the police department on that project. And then lastly, the fire training center master plan, which is uh, hopefully we'll just get started uh, sometime later this month. The first. Uh, item was the fire station project, and our current approach to this project is to limit the project to our current allocation, which is uh, almost uh, 4.6 million. That'll cover the seismic, ADA, and second floor crew quarters aspects of the project, uh, which were really the original objectives of the project, but uh, the, that gives us some unresolved issues, and that is uh, the replacement office space for administrative and prevention staff, and then the development of an adequate city emergency operations center. So those issues, uh, before we can actually get started on the construction project, we'll need to deal with uh, those, at least the, uh, the replacement office space issue. And um, that's one that uh, originally we were going to move into a different location, but the costs uh, have come in high, and we're trying to stay within our, uh, our existing allocation, which is reflected in this current year's uh, CIP. Uh, the next uh, a big initiative, of course, is the wildland fire projects. And again, we're, we're doing over 20 miles of road vegetation clearance per year. That compares to seven miles we used to be able to do before the benefit assessment district was created. Uh, we've done almost 800 uh, cubic yards of chipping in, uh, for the neighborhoods this last year. And we hope to be able to do that every year. That's, um, and we reuse 80% of those chip, uh, chips back onto the property where they came from. 
Only 20 percent actually go to another location, a landfill, because they're invasive pest species. Defensible Space Inspection Program, we're just getting started with that. We already have some work going on that, and Chief Vaughn will talk about that in a minute. And then we have actually this coming year, we should have some money developing in the way of reserves to be able to work on some bigger projects on private and public lands regarding fuels management. This next slide just shows the 20, actually this year I think we got up to almost 23 miles of road clearance. And there's 52 miles of public roads in this area, so we're able to do almost half of the roads in the whole high fire hazard area this year by virtue of the extra money that was provided by the Benefit Assessment District. This is just a couple of quick slides about how that went. You can just go through these real quick, Pete. It's a really aggressive program. It worked out great. The Disaster Preparedness Program, these are some initiatives that we hope to do this next year. Expansion of our CERT program, update our emergency management plans, increase the training for city employees, and improve public information communication techniques. And items A, B, and C are really going to be a collaborative effort with the county, OAS, some of our other partners, and the fire service. We need to do this in a regional way if we can. And with respect to dealing with the local media, partnering, and actually this summer we'll do some investigation on our capacity to do a low-powered AM radio station that we would actually operate with several agencies. We need to obviously look at the reverse 911 system and either bolster that, make that a more robust system than it is right now with the county, or consider as a last option perhaps purchasing our own 911, reverse 911 system, and then aggressively maintain our OAS website and the 211 system. This is just some quick slides just to show our last initiative was the big drill on the 28th of April. A lot of interesting things came out of that, both in the city's EOC environment as well as out in the field. And we'll do a presentation about that at a future date, probably in two or three weeks, to the city council. This is just some slides of our CERT program. Right now we do about four of these classes a year. We think if we can get more instructors certified over the next few months, we can actually double those classes, go to maybe eight CERT classes per year. One of the other initiatives we want to do this next year is, like I mentioned earlier, is install the mobile data computers in the trucks, update our automatic mutual aid protocols, and it will give us access to the latest GIS and records management data that we have. So in the field, people will be able to, our incident commanders can actually access, once these computers are installed, access a lot of data that will help them manage the incident. Lastly, the fire training center master plan, like I said, hopefully later this month we'll start that. This is also some funding that came as a result of having that unanticipated revenue. The council authorized us to spend up to $35,000 for a master plan a few months ago. And we plan to develop this existing site. We want to figure out every possible prop that we can work into that site and come up with a long-range plan so we can do our improvements to that property in a very systematic way. In a nutshell, that's it. And I'm going to hand it over to Deputy Chief Mitch Vaughn. Okay. Mayor Bloom, members of council, good afternoon. Mitch Vaughn, Deputy Fire Chief. Uh, the previous map you saw was just to uh, reacquaint you with the location of our fire stations. Um, and I'm going to address that with the first bullet point in our P3 highlights. Um, when we currently provide any type of training, whether it's uh, hands-on manipulative training or classroom training, we rotate uh, four of the stations in at one time normally to our training center uh, to provide that training. In the afternoon, we'll bring in the other four stations to receive that same type of training. Uh, one of the P3 highlights is to reduce travel by 30 mile, or by 30 percent. Um, and, and the way we're going to do that is we've just recently installed a new uh, interactive video training system. What we hope to do is cut down our trips for classroom sessions only. We can actually leave the um, engine companies in their stations, in their own districts, still providing the, the full excellent coverage that we currently have uh, when they're in their districts not attending training. Um, it's a, uh, a system where you can watch the, the training provided. You can also ask questions. And we were just able to provide the uh, first training session using this new system last week. Uh, we used Station 8 as our, as our kind of trial run. 
and it seemed to work okay. We still have a few bugs to work out, but it's our hope that in the very near future for classroom sessions we can leave the engine companies in their stations so they still can respond in a very timely manner. With respect to emergency uh, services training and outreach, uh, we hope to continue to provide increased training for all of our city employees um, to raise them to the, to the level so that they have a comfort level when we have a natural disaster, when we have something in the city that requires response. Uh, we propose to do that in a couple of different ways um, to continue to add to our LEAP training. We currently have some NIMS training uh, that is, is qualifying for LEAP credit. It's mandatory training. Uh, we're looking at online training uh, in the same way that a lot of the colleges and universities use distance learning. Um, and of course the hands-on training that we'll have to do uh, for, for some of the training. Uh, as Chief Prince mentioned, we also hope to in, uh, increase the number of our community emergency response training, our CERT trainings. A very popular class. We often have more requests than we can handle. In the past, we've uh, our goal was to provide three classes per year. We've already done four this year, and uh, we certainly expect to increase that to probably six to eight classes or, uh, per year in the next fiscal year. Um, we also have a, um, a segment coming out by Government Access City TV where they are going to video a series of the CERT trainings uh, to, to show the public uh, what's covered under disaster uh, preparedness. <clears throat> also in the next fiscal year, we expect to uh, get the new state fire codes, which is in concert with the new uh, building codes, and to uh, bring that to council for approval. We're also exploring uh, options with regard to updating our current residential fire sprinklers or, or the fire sprinkler requirements uh, here in the city. But again, we're just exploring options right now. Uh, we expect to uh, have some options uh, later on down the road. And last but not least, we've also touched on this is the initiation of our residential defensible space inspections in the high fire hazard zones. And again, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest. We've already had 40 requests for um, voluntary inspections. They've, they've called the fire department, sent in interest cards, and we're in the process of making appointments, having the engine companies go out, walk around the property with the property owners making recommendations and suggestions. And again, it's, it's a very popular program. We've also held uh, an open house up at our fire station on Stanwood Drive. Uh, we've had a number of workshops held up in the high fire hazard area. And again, we have uh, approximately 40 requests at this point. So it is, it is turning out to be the success we had hoped. Uh, Mayor and Council, that's really the, uh, our presentation. And I uh, would ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you very much. I've noticed, um, I, I think I've noticed a, a, a lot of structure fires, which we don't usually have. Um, and uh, is there a reason for that, or is there? I mean, maybe it just goes in cycles or something. But I, I'm surprised. Apartments burning and so on. It it does seem to go in cycles. You're you're right. Usually we have three or four, uh, and we've had uh, actually three two alarm fires in the last uh, two weeks. So it's, yeah, it's been very busy. We're just hoping on weather days like today that we don't have the same uh, experience because it could be disastrous. Right. Well, we've been lucky about no loss of life and just uh, and all that, except for the cats. But, you know, otherwise, yeah, which is very sad. But, um, but anyway, I just noticed that lately. Mr. Horton. Um, I noticed on, uh, G on uh, G131, uh, students participating in fire safety house programs and what I have is, is more of a suggestion than a question. Next week, um, I think maybe it's Monday, we're having a, um, uh, a group of people in the community get together about finding employment for teenage youth um, in situations where they might learn something that, that could be useful in later careers and things like that. Is there any, anything that you could do in your operation, or maybe this is the kind of thing, to give uh, kids in the community a sense of the kind of work that you do and uh, maybe get them thinking about this is how they'd like to put their careers. 
It's yeah. interesting you would uh, mention that, Councilman Horton. We actually do use volunteers right now with our fire safety house, and all third graders in town get to work through the uh, fire safety house, and that's almost run exclusively by volunteers. Uh, we could expand that, though, and uh, it's, it is a great opportunity for people to get exposed to the fire service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. House? Um, it's not nothing really almost regarding the budget except this one little thing. I, I, a friend of mine closed their business recently here in town, and um, in the process everything had to be emptied out and taken away, and uh, we got down in the basement. This is right downtown just on State Street, and it was pretty remarkable how old and re, I mean, the old timber, you know, the old str construction and all the old wiring down there. And some of it, I guess, had been improved because there had been some improvements to the building. But there was just, I mean, a tangle of old wires and old plumbing and things. And, um, and I, I, both in the uh, M1 area, the, the old buildings along Haley and Gutierrez and the ones downtown in Central Business District, I mean, we're going back a long time with some of these structures. And we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on the wildland fire hazard, but as we've seen, um, a small thing can cause the loss of quite a bit of commercial property with these old buildings. Um, so a comment and a question. Comment is, I guess, when we have new structures, and I can see you've really identified your efforts here, that everything is up to code and from a fire safety perspective. So when we get new buildings downtown, it makes it fire safer. But what about the old buildings? I, I only saw one line in here where we talk about conduct fire and, well, no, uh, code enforcement, compliance inspections. Is that the one program activity that really addresses that? Yeah. Actually, in two areas we do uh, inspections of existing buildings. The engine companies themselves, they'll go out and they do uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 inspections on commercial buildings per year. In addition to that, we've got the whole Fire Prevention Bureau who does all the plans check for new construction. They, they respond to all complaints. And uh, so they're very, very busy. But it's, uh, you know, you can never do, do enough in this area. You're right. There's thousands of buildings. And so we do a pretty good effort. I think for a city our size, our fire prevention efforts and code enforcement efforts, efforts are exemplary. But I think uh, when we do find an old building like that and there's an old basement, I mean, it poses all sorts of challenges for us, and especially if, uh, if we have a fire in a basement like that. It's very, yeah, very dangerous. The city dangerous. just filled up with them, you know. And, and I guess my emphasis wasn't on the new construction because I know you're all over it. It's the, the initiating the review and being able to get Get down into and around and look at some of these conditions because once you add all the stuff that's stored in those basements, I mean, it wouldn't take much to start a fire that could cost us quite a bit downtown. Um, so, in your budget, where does that show up, basically? I'm just kind of curious as to how that shows up as a because it's only in the numbers that it becomes real. If you look in the operations section, which would be uh, look under G137. Okay. I think you'll see uh, at the, near the very bottom, engine company fire and safety inspections. Uh, we project this year alone to do over almost 1,800 of those inspections on existing commercial occupancies. I see. Um, that, so that's one area where we actually get the engine companies in and they walk around the building and get a sense of what there is to burn and actually uh, note violations and, and get code compliance that way. Uh, that's one of our biggest efforts. We have the, our largest amount of folks are on the engine companies. But again, um, I'm, I'm a fire prevention advocate. Uh, you can you can never do enough in this area. But what I would certainly suggest is if, if we do know of specific hazards in any given building, uh, we go out and immediately make those inspections, whether it be a blocked exit or or uh, poor housekeeping that uh, somebody walks into a business and they, they call us and we're concerned about it. Usually within 24 hours, we're out on the street checking out those hazards. Is it Mrs. O'Leary's cow that kicked over the <laughs> lantern in Chicago? Okay, well just thank you very much. Sure. Okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. You're very good. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, and I guess our meeting is adjourned until tomorrow. Only not adjourned to tomorrow, but till tomorrow. <laughs>